Um, we are delighted to be back with our climate conversation sessions. Uh, it has really felt like a very long time since June, and it is great to have such an exciting lineup of speakers for the coming term at Oxford. Um, so we hope wherever you are, you are well and safe, and we hope that this series will add to the positive events you feel you want to engage with and participate in, and just offer a little relief during this strange and challenging 2020. As someone very famous said, this will help things turn out for the best and always look on the bright side of life. So one good thing about switching totally to these online seminars instead of having in-person ones is that many of you wanted to attend our talks before and you are now able to join us um, and uh, you will be also able to rewatch talks or catch up if you miss any session. Uh, Jana will explain more in a minute about our setup of seminars and the question answer sessions. For the ones who don't know us yet, Primate Conversations is a series created by the Primate Models for Behavioral Evolution Lab. Uh, we are part of the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology at the School of Anthropology and Museum Ethnography in Oxford. Uh, we started this initiative in 2016, it's four years now, with the aim really to foster interdisciplinary discussions uh, between primatologists, paleoanthropologists, conservationists, and beyond. And it has become increasingly popular, which, is, which we are very happy about and uh, appreciated, I think, within Oxford, the UK, and beyond. Uh, crucially, our series is organized every year by a group of graduate uh, students and postdoctoral fellows. So they are fully responsible for who is invited, uh, why and when, and they host the sessions and discussions. So don't worry, you will see me very little. Today is an exception just to open the academic year series, but I'm going soon to pass the, the, the ball to this great group of people and uh, because they are the ones really making this uh, happen. So ahead of the session, I really want to thank uh, Jana Muszynski, Alejandra Pascual Garrido, Sophie Verdugo, Alex Milka, and Elodie Freeman. Uh, Elodie, who is not only a primatologist, <clears throat> but also an artist responsible for the amazing, <clears throat> excuse me, poster and series image. I thank them all for the work during these such challenging times, particularly difficult times, and for keeping the bar really high with this series. So <clears throat> our events are thought within a philosophy of being child and family friendly now more than ever, because we cannot control anything and you can have whoever you want attending these talks from pets to, uh, to, to everyone at the, in your house, uh, diverse, inclusive, and we have developed a set of tools to help addressing um, some issues of uh, unbalance with participation during question time. For example, when we had in-person seminars, we were um, giving the audience a Google uh, form. And so you could go online and submit your question anonymously during the talk without the stress of having to face uh, asking a question. And we are trying to come up with ideas to address some of these um, uh, issues in uh, academia and in seminar settings. So our series, as you know, has hosted incredible scientists from all the fields of research that we are working on within uh, the lab and the department. And this year is no exception. Uh, I am particularly happy today, quite thrilled to be able to host, to host Dr. Brian Hare. Shall I say Professor Brian Hare? Uh, I will leave uh, the more formal academic introduction to Jana Muszynski, but I just want to say that we were just talking about this and we always met in Japan. We met first in Japan and every single time we reunited was in Japan, uh, very much thanks to common colleagues and to uh, uh, Tetsuro Matsuzawa. Um, I think first was a 2008 seminar where I was very, very nervous because I was just starting my PhD and Brian was already quite a, a preeminent sci scientist. And then again uh, in 2010 during an amazing field seminar um, in Tools in Primates at the Sasagamini Wet of Kyoto University followed by a lot of fun at the IPS uh, in Kyoto. So I am from the time when Brian was working a lot at the Lola Yabonovo Sanctuary in DRC and was expanding from investigating cognitive evolution in primates to take a cross-species approach by looking at domestic dogs and humans. Uh, 
Uh, I think we met when you were ending your uh, doctor postdoctoral position at the Max Planck and then became a professor at Duke University. Um, and you soon, and Brian soon followed by founding the Duke Canine Cognition Center. Um, during the past 10 years, such a long time, I have followed Brian's very successful career and also appreciating how he is engaged with uh, producing some real societal impacts via, for example, the creation of the citizen science platforms like the Dognition or publishing very important uh, popular science bestseller books like Dog Genius. And now he just wrote this great book with Vanessa Woods um, that is just out. And if you don't have it, you really must get it, The Survival of the Friendliest. So thank you so, so much for joining us uh, today. Um, uh, we are super happy and a little emotional. I hope everyone has a great time. And now to you, Jana Muschiski, for just the second half of the seminar introduction. Thank you. Dr. Brian Hare is currently a professor of evolutionary anthropology and a core member of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at Duke University. Uh, he's taken a comparative cognition approach since early in his career, his study species over the years having included domesticated dogs, wolves, chimpanzees, bonobos, humans, lemurs, and foxes, among others. Comparative cognition allows you to test how factors such as social systems, life history, and morphology are related to cognitive abilities, how between species cognitive differences relate to their phylogenetic relatedness, and learn more about the evolution of specific cognitive skills. At Duke, Dr. Hare currently runs the Three Chimps Project and the Duke Canine Cognition Center. Brian's research spans a variety of topics across domestication, human evolution, cognition, and the development and training of working dogs. Some of his contributions include the self-domestication hypothesis, large cross-species studies on self-control, and large amounts of in-depth work on bonobo and chimpanzee sociality, tolerance, sharing, and cognitive skills. More recently, he has directed or is currently directing several longitudinal studies on canine cognition and development. He has won several high-profile young researcher awards, including the Sofia Kovalevskaya Award, which is Germany's most prestigious award for scientists under age 40. He also strives to make his work publicly accessible, producing international bestsellers along the way, as Susanna mentioned. Now that we've introduced our guests, I'll just give a quick note on how our seminars are, are organized. Primate Conversations is a series that typically happens in person, as Susanna mentioned, um, but our shift in online format uh, is allowing us to share our series with a, a broader, more inclusive audience. If this is your first time joining us online, after the talk, we have a, few, a short Q&A session, which I'll help moderate, and which you can participate in by submitting questions in the comment section of the YouTube live stream. We appreciate any feedback or suggestions as well, so please feel free to post those as well. Brian, again, thank you so much for opening our seminar, seminar series, and I pass over to you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you all. And uh, let me just do a couple of things for myself so I make sure I don't talk too long. And then let's get slides up here and make sure we're working there too. All right, uh, Jana, Susanna, can you see the slides okay? The slide, the first slide? Yep. All right, great. Well, thank you guys for inviting me. And uh, it's so exciting to visit Oxford and to spend some time with all of y'all. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not there in person, um, but again, as Susanna and Yana said, the silver lining is that folks can join from wherever. And uh, I guess I don't have to suffer from jet lag. So uh, you gotta stay positive. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, work on dogs and bonobos today um, and what they might tell us about ourselves. Uh, and um, uh, I wanna really um, sort of go through some of the arguments we make in the book, uh, Survival of the Friendliest, the new book, uh, and, and it, the arguments that we make or that I make in um, a published paper um, by the same title in Annual Review of Psychology. Um, but before I get too far along, um, I have to say thank you to a lot of people too, uh, because everything I present um, uh, is due to a lot of collaboration with a lot of other people. I hope I represent it well, uh, and I'm thankful to all these folks. Um, especially, wait, let me go back. I gotta say, especially to my wife, Vanessa, who helped me write the book and helped me think about a lot of the arguments I'm gonna be making today. She's a science journalist, um, and uh, a lot of times they don't get as much credit as they probably deserve. Um, and so it's, it was really interesting writing a science book with a science journalist. And you can imagine our book is really a marriage of trying to tell stories, making things understandable, but getting it right all at the same time. So 
uh, if you enjoy it, it's despite me, let's put it that way. Okay, so that's the cover of the new book. Uh, this is the paper, uh, the scientific paper you can read that a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is based on. Um, this is the cheeky UK cover. Uh, the book is also being uh, published by One World, which is a UK publisher. Um, I don't know which one's better, uh, but uh, I think it's pretty cool and pretty cheeky. Um, all right, so uh, survival of friendliness, the idea is, uh, of the book is that actually the public conception of survival of the fittest, which is really how think the first thing people think of when they think of evolution, is really a, uh, in the popular mind is a misconstrual of evolution. Of course, when fitness is defined in biology as reproductive success, but in the mind of most people in the public, uh, it actually means strong, alpha, bigger, tougher, and uh, that misconstrual has led uh, to the justification of a lot of horrific things in history because uh, when fitness uh, or survival of the fittest is misconstrued to mean uh, strong alpha, the big should win, um, there's uh, all of a sudden value given to uh, groups that are seen as superior and value taken away from those that are seen as inferior. Um, so of course, that's not what survival of the fittest means. Fitness just refers to reproductive success. And so the title of the book was to try to combat that misunderstanding and make the point that actually, if you step back and you look at life and you ask the question, uh, what are some of the biggest jumps in evolution? A lot of them are increases in friendliness, that then allow for a new type of cooperation. So just some examples here quickly. Uh, I can't go through them all, but uh, my, probably my two favorite right now are uh, penguins huddling. Uh, the only terrestrial vertebrate that can live year round in Antarctica are penguins. And they do it because they actually um, huddle in close uh, quarters, stay warm, and can make it through the winter. Of course, most birds uh, stay very far away from each other. If you see them on the power line, they always space. Uh, and so it's actually quite unusual, this type of friendliness, where they basically hug all winter to stay warm. And that's the type of friendliness I'm talking about. Another one would be, uh, which will be an important example, um, for the talk is uh, cleaner wrasse. Cleaner wrasse are the fish that clean the mouths of other fish. They've replaced a fear of predators with an attraction to them. And in fact, cleaner wrasse swim into the mouths of predators that should eat them. And so there's been evolution where fear has been replaced with friendliness, an attraction to interact and have a social um, relationship. And we know that cleaner wrasse are, have amazing cooperative behavior as a result. Um, so there's also the cases where you have humans interacting with animals, and um, this is me in Australia with a, a rainbow lorikeet that wouldn't leave me alone, um, and that's sort of a story we're going to tell um, today also about, um, I'll try to outline today about the evolution of dogs. Um, so uh, now transitioning to a specific example and how I got started down this road of thinking of survival of the fittest. Oh, sorry, friendliness, it is really a story about dogs. Um, and uh, how I got excited about survival of the friendliness, friendliest, it started from a cognitive perspective. It was um, a discovery that, um, this is a more recent uh, demonstration, but the discovery that uh, dogs have human-like cooperative communicative skills. Uh, it seems they understand human gestures and they understand um, our intentions in those gestures in a way that is more like what human children do than our close uh, primate relatives, bonobos and chimpanzees. That's surprising because they're so distantly related and of course they don't look like us. So why would dogs so distantly related be doing something that developmentally is critical in humans for the development of culture? and language. Um, so that's sort of where this all started for me is trying to solve that puzzle. But let me just show some data to uh, demonstrate what I mean. This is uh, comparisons of uh, using different gestural communication uh, in uh, for, or I should say, yeah, for great ape species and, the, and dogs. And you see that dogs, when it comes to the measure of social cognition, are the species that look most like humans. Uh, when it comes to uh, understanding uh, phys the physical world, um, these measures of physical cognition over here, uh, don't ask your dog to do your physics homework. Um, so it does seem like dogs, when it comes to understanding our gestures, um, are more like us than our great ape um, relatives when it comes to their skills. 
um, when you just have a sort of measure of how successful they are at reading gestures. Um, but it's not that they're better at everything, obviously. Great apes are, um, um, it seems that it's a very specialized ability. Um, so uh, the next thing though, is that that's just, uh, uh, the next thing is then when we looked at the individual differences in these abilities. And what we found is that uh, kids, uh, when you look at their uh, performance on the social cognitive measures above versus the physical cognitive measures. If you're good at one, you're good at all of the social skills or social tests. And if you're good at the physical, at one of them, you're good at all of them. And that's all that's just depicted here um, in this dendrogram. But when we looked at chimpanzees, it ends up that there really wasn't a pattern. If you were good at one social, it didn't matter. It wasn't related to your performance on any of the other social. So it seems that humans have sort of a social type of cognition and then another uh, type of cognition uh, that is for physical reasoning. All right, so what about dogs? It ends up that dogs of the species we've able, been able to measure look more like humans in having different, uh, a different type of cognition. So one for solving these social type of problems and one uh, for solving these more physical problems. When you look at individual differences, so this isn't level of performance, this is looking at individuals and if they do well with one problem, do they do well with other, uh, another related problem? Uh, or is it unrelated uh, across the different domains? So it seems that there's a social domain, a physical domain in humans and dogs that's similar. It's not just the level of performance. So this is pretty remarkable. Uh, and so this is a problem uh, that is a fascinating one to solve. How could this be? How could dogs look more like us? So uh, I had the great uh, pleasure to travel to Siberia and work with uh, Belaya foxes. Belaya foxes were experimentally domesticated um, and I was able to measure their understanding of gestural communication. I've also worked with um, wolves uh, and measured their skills at gestural communication. And we've and I've measured all these different uh, populations when they were uh, young puppies, uh, before they had tremendous exposure to humans. And what you see is that uh, the domesticated line of Belaya foxes that were experimentally domesticated, um, they outperform uh, control foxes that were not selected uh, in the same way uh, in relation to how they interact with humans. Uh, and dogs uh, outperform wolves. So we take this uh, pattern to suggest that it's domestication. Something happened during domestication that actually allowed for this unusual cooperative communication to evolve in this distant relative. All right. And then to, uh, other researchers have added to this case uh, by finding things like uh, an oxytocin loop, an interspecies oxytocin loop between humans and dogs. So just like when uh, adult uh, humans or parents, I should say, begin interacting with their infants uh, and they make eye contact and they touch and there's bonding through this uh, oxytocin uh, loop where the inner Interaction, the eye contact increases oxytocin in the infant and in the adult, and there's bonding. Uh, it seems that this same process is happening between human and dog, uh, and it's not happening between uh, human and wolf, even when wolves are raised uh, by humans. Even more interesting is that there may be, uh, there's some very nice evidence from Julian Kaminsky's lab showing that there may be morphological changes related to this because dogs actually have some musculature in their faces that allow them to reveal their white parts of their eye uh, and allow, uh, or actually it may even enhance this oxytocin uh, loop. Um, and so they pull this muscle back and make that guilty eye that's irresistible. Uh, and it seems that that may be part of what encourages the bonding between human and dog. So effectively they've hijacked our social bonding pathway. Wolves don't have this muscle and they don't, um, uh, they don't tend to um, uh, flex it, uh, the, the smaller version of it that they have. Okay, so um, it seems that there is a potential case for the differences that we see in dogs that are so important um, uh, or these abilities that seem to be so important for humans that it's something that happened during domestication. And to go back to the foxes, and many of you are familiar with the story of the foxes, uh, Belayev began in uh, uh, 1959 selecting a population of foxes to be friendly to people. Uh, he 
and his colleagues, uh, especially Ludmilla Trott and Irene Plyasanina, uh, they worked for decades and they continually each year would select uh, foxes that were friendly to humans, would approach, would not bite, were not aggressive but actually even actively sought out human contact and wanted to be pet and could be held and actually enjoyed being held. And they would breed those foxes together, the friendliest foxes. And year after year, they were increasingly selecting friendlier and friendlier foxes together. Uh, brilliantly, they kept a control line uh, and they did not breed that control line uh, for their uh, response to uh, human interaction. Uh, and as a result, no surprise, the fox's behaviors change over generations. They become increasingly friendly. I can tell you I've visited them. They love people um, and they want to be held and interact uh, and with very little or maybe no socialization. Um, and But even more remarkable and what the experiment's uh, probably most famous for is that uh, selecting for friendliness had a whole bunch of other impacts on uh, the physiology, the development, the body or morphology of the foxes, their faces, their skulls. And I've already told you, I discovered their cooperative communicative abilities. Uh, the reason this is remarkable is because none of these things were directly selected for. There was just one selection criteria, which was, will you approach and interact and have a friendly um, uh, you know, interaction with a human? Um, so not unlike those cleaner rats I was telling you that go from being fearful to being attracted to a predator, the foxes uh, go, were selected over time to instead of hide in the back and uh, you know, maybe bite if you try to touch them, they were selected to actually want to approach and jump in your arms. Uh, the thought is that there is a, an early uh, developmental change that occurs um, in uh, fetal development. Uh, and one hypothesis is that it's um, neural crest development. These are cells that are pluripotent stem cells that migrate throughout the body. They're involved in the development of the HPA axis, uh, the serotonergic system uh, that obviously is involved and um, facilitates the expression of oxytocin as well. And so uh, the, one of the main hypotheses is that these cells have somehow been altered in how they migrate uh, early in uh, the neural crest uh, uh, cells. Uh, site where it originates, and that that also had impact on uh, melanin, uh, morphology, and facial uh, and skull shape. And important is that um, one of the um, physiological, sorry, morphological changes is the foxes have some, uh, smaller muzzles, shorter muzzles, uh, and smaller canine teeth. That's going to be important later because basically selecting for friendliness, um, you get all these uh, changes not just in behavior, but in the body. Well, that means potentially you can look for changes in body uh, as a signal for selection for friendliness. Okay, uh, so where uh, I want to head next and where this experiment took us was, wait a second, if selection for friendliness and artificial selection can do all this, what about natural selection? And in the book and in the paper that I suggested, uh, we make the case that actually natural selection has selected different species for friendliness, uh, and these are candidates uh, for that type of selection. And that the same pattern that we see in the foxes, uh, we should see, if we're correct, uh, in these different species in comparison to their progenitor, their last common ancestor that had not undergone this type of selection for friendliness. All right, so the model is you have uh, a fitness increase via fitness, or sorry, via friendliness. Uh, it alters development, some developmental pathway. Um, and as a result of that, it doesn't just change the behavior and the social behavior that's under selection, but there's accidental byproducts. Uh, and one of those accidental byproducts can be uh, changes in cooperative communication. So many people have argued there's um, differences uh, in cooperative communication across different species and many people have argued that there's differences in friendliness. I think what's really unique here is we're saying that friendliness can cause increases in uh, cooperative communication via um, uh, developmental uh, changes. All right, I think there's lots of different candidates for self-domestication. The race is on. Uh, it's actually a really exciting uh, hypothesis to go try to test even if it's super complicated.
Uh, and it has many uh, strands, but I do think it's a falsifiable hypothesis. Um, and so I'm excited about it. Um, and I wanna share with you uh, some of uh, the evidence we can bring to bear. And I, I, uh, I wish I could go more into detail uh, and I could give you know uh, an hour or more talk on each uh, case here, um, but uh, in the interest of time and, I, and to make sure I have plenty of time to entertain your questions, um, and uh, I, I'm going to just highlight some of the um, uh, examples of ways we've tried to test the hypotheses. Okay, so uh, amazing uh, is uh, the case that um, uh, bonobos actually uh, are a candidate for self-domestication. Uh, it's amazing because it seems like, well, they're this close relative. How could they uh, be uh, self-domesticated? Um, how could there be selection for friendliness that causes changes in development? Uh, and then this cascading effect across the phenotype, including uh, some change in cooperative communication. Um, so the argument that Richard Rangham and I, uh, Richard Rangham uh, in, in the Bonobo work was uh, central and sort of uh, was the first person to sort of say, hey, uh, do you think we can explain some, some of the differences between uh, chimpanzees and bonobos by thinking about the foxes as a model? Um, and the reason that we started thinking this is that we know that bonobo uh, females do not tolerate male aggression the same way that chimpanzee uh, females have to endure uh, sexual coercion, uh, infanticide, uh, lethal raids, um, uh, and uh, other types, uh, you know, despotic alpha males and other types of uh, male aggression in chimpanzee society. Uh, all the things I just listed don't exist. Uh, there's never in bonobo society, no bonobo has ever been observed to kill another bonobo. Uh, and there's no cases of infanticide, which is really quite remarkable uh, if you think about it. Okay, so uh, bonobos live south of the Congo River uh, while the subspecies of chimpanzees all live uh, in uh, Central Africa, uh, East and West, bonobos all live south of the Congo River in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Central Africa. Um, and so one of the hypotheses is there's something different ecologically that allowed for bonobo females to form friendships, to be friendlier with each other. Uh, and because they could, uh, be attracted to each other, be friendly with one another, spend time together, be more gregarious, uh, they could form alliances, they could defend each other uh, from male aggression in a way that chimpanzee females cannot. Uh, one of the hints at how this may have happened uh, in over evolutionary time after the two species diverged one, uh, over one million years ago is there are no gorillas that uh, are known to have ever lived sympatrically uh, with bonobos. So it may have been partly feeding competition with other species. Um, there are other ideas about what ecological differences may have changed the cost benefit of gregariousness between females. But the idea is that female bonobos became more gregarious and because of that they could actually uh, prevent male aggression by forming alliances against them. And there's beautiful work in Wamba and Louis Catal uh, in uh, the long-term field sites that suggest this may indeed be happening. We have our own work in captivity as well. So based on that and the idea of the foxes, um, we came up with a model uh, for uh, bonobo uh, self-domestication. Um, the idea is just like the foxes being selected for friendliness, uh, bonobos underwent a selection for friendliness. Specifically in the case of uh, bonobos, it was that the cost of male aggression actually um, was outweighed by the benefits. Uh, and so actually it was the friendliest, least aggressive males that were at a selective advantage. One of the fun uh, new findings is both in uh, Wamba and Louis Catal, we now know that the um, reproductive skew uh, in males is actually higher in bonobos than in chimpanzees, which means that the most successful male bonobo is, has higher reproductive success than the most successful despotic alpha chimpanzee male. So really friendliness can win. Uh, and the thinking is that that's through female choice because females can choose to mate with, they have a preference for one male and uh, he does extraordinarily well as a result. Okay, so this was our model um, and we had a whole bunch of predictions uh, of the model. Um, and, uh, but, but basically the general argument is that there was selection for friendliness, females preferred friendlier males, it changed male development, 
um, and that had cascading effects. And we should see some predictable changes that are equivalent to what we see in foxes and, and dogs. All right, so I'm just gonna highlight one example, one test. Um, if you want more, um, uh, sorry, you can uh, visit uh, the behaviors cited, I mean, sorry, the papers cited below. Uh, we have a new book uh, from uh, actually Oxford University Press uh, called Bonobos. Uh, and uh, it really goes into great detail about how we've tested this model. Um, but one, one example, and it's my favorite example because I was shocked by it, it surprised me. And it was actually the idea of the Congolese student, Susie Quatinda, I was working with. Um, she really said, I think that bonobos are gonna share food uh, with other bonobos. Uh, and I said, oh, come on, I've been working with chimpanzees for a long time. There's no way that if you let them in and there's a bunch of food, they're not just gonna eat it all. Um, and she said, no, 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 I think they will. And so um, we set up an experiment where uh, bono a bonobo was released into a room. It was full of food. It was before breakfast. They were really, really hungry. Um, and they could just eat all the food or they could open a one-way key. There's a one-way key that it, uh, blocks a door that's adjacent to the room they're in. And if they pull the key out, then another bonobo can join them and they can eat the food together. Um, so the question was, would they eat all the food? Would they open the door? Would they get in a big fight? What would happen? Uh, and this is an example of a three to four year old bonobo named Sake. Um, and she's hungry, this is before breakfast. Uh, you can see the one way key is here and she can just leave it and keep eating, but she elects to open the door, let Aleke in, another young bonobo, and they eat uh, and share the food. And uh, you're going to see sharing is fun. Um, and so we did this with adults. We did this with a whole different set of combinations of bonobos. And we never saw any fighting. Uh, there was just sharing. Um, and there was a significant number of trials where they would open the door. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, but what does that have to do with self-domestication? It doesn't yet. Here's the fun finding. The fun finding is that then we got really excited about these one-way keys. And we said, what if we made two? two one-way keys. And not only do they have the choice between whether to share or not, but who to share with. And we said, what about a group mate versus a complete stranger? Because we're in a sanctuary, Lola Ya Bonobo, these are all orphan bonobos. They're unrelated uh, and they're multiple groups. And because they're bonobos, it's safe to actually bring a stranger and allow them to have a physical interaction. I couldn't do this with chimpanzees. It would be unethical. Um, so we lined up bonobos uh, in a situation like this, where there was a row of three rooms, two uh, one-way keys between them. And we just asked Sake and the other bonobos, hey, when you come in, who would you rather open the door for? Well, when this type of uh, question or experiment is done with humans, the answer is, well, I'm going to open for my family and my group mate that I have a relationship with. I'm not going to share some discretionary money that I with some person I've never even met. I'm going to take somebody out to lunch I know or send them flowers or make somebody I know happy. I'm not going to just do some. I'm not going to walk up and just in a cafeteria and just give my lunch to somebody waiting in line that I've never met before. Um, but what we found in the bonobos is that they actually had a very strong preference to open the door, the one-way door for a complete stranger, somebody they had never, and that's defined as another bonobo they never had a physical interaction with. They may have seen them or heard them at Lola Ya Bonobo, but they never physically interacted with them. And so they had a very strong uh, preference to open the door, let a stranger in. This is remarkable because they are genetically almost identical to chimpanzees for all intents and purposes. The genetic differences is like wolf dog in terms of um, the relative differences, yet uh, chimpanzees are highly xenophobic. Uh, this would not be a safe experiment to do with them. And with bonobos, they actually prefer to let in an individual they've never met before and share. Now, what's even more interesting about this experiment is I have to tell you, this is one of the other funny things that was a big surprise is what happened was, this is one of the great fun uh, kind of findings you went, and joys of working with animals and studying animal behavior. So I thought that was the end of the story. When we designed the experiment, it was like, okay, they're going to make a choice and one's going to let in and one's not. And we'll look and, you know, see, see who they prefer. Okay, so the, I just told you they prefer the stranger, but do you know what else happened? So the stranger would come in and in about half the time, they would walk over and open the other one-way key because the one who's labeled group mate is strange to them. And so the last thing you do if you were a chimpanzee is let in another stranger so you're outnumbered 
uh, and then share food together with them. Um, but bonobos think it's super fun to hang out with strangers and eat food together. And so that's just uh, a remarkable example and test of this idea that they really have had selection for friendliness, uh, the, the benefit of meeting a new social partner, having an, uh, an expanded social network outweighs the cost because there isn't lethal aggression in the species. Um, and so they can take the risk of making a new friend. Okay, so that's one of the ways that um, we uh, tested this self-domestication hypothesis in bonobos. There's other exciting things um, where there's examples of bonobo morphology looking uh, similar to uh, wolf dog if you compare chimpanzee uh, bonobo in terms of how their skulls develop, uh, in terms of their colorations, all sorts of other things that seem to be uh, analogous. There's now genetic tests that are ongoing looking at some of um, the genes in the serotonergic system, uh, in the oxytocin system, uh, that suggests maybe there's been positive selection in bonobos in uh, places where you might predict if this is what happened during their evolution. Okay, so now in the remaining time that I have, I wanna switch and take this self-domestication idea and think about humans. Um, and I think one of the big surprises uh, in uh, human evolution, uh, if you're somebody like me who uh, is fascinated about where we came from and I study animals to try to help us understand who we are and how we got here, um, the, uh, I think the finding of um, a paleoanthropologists over the last 10 years that is that is most shocking is that we were not alone uh, as a species on uh, the planet until relatively recently. Uh, there were uh, several other uh, human species in our genus that all had big brains. They all were cultural and probably linguistic in some way we would recognize. Um, and they all, of course, went extinct, but relatively recently. And so this sets up the question, well, what happened to them and how come we're the one that survived and thrived and they all went extinct? the normal explanations we would use now are suspect because uh, big brain language and culture, if anything, predicts extinction, not survival and success. So uh, in thinking about the argument of dog evolution, bonobo evolution, and how friendliness plays a key role there and uh, potentially increasing their cooperative uh, communication, uh, what about now uh, thinking about our own species? Does this hypothesis really have anything to do with us? Um, well, it took about a decade of thinking and scratching my head uh, together with Richard Wrangham, uh, who is also, I, I've, I've failed to mention, he's written a wonderful book called The Goodness Paradox, which I strongly recommend you read, um, uh, where he proposes uh, uh, the self-domestication hypothesis for humans as well. Um, and we agree on many things, and then there's some places where we have uh, different ideas. Um, and so it'll be fun in the future to uh, work through all those. But the idea is that um, after a decade or so of wondering, does this really have anything to do with humans? Could it really have anything to do with humans? In my own case, it was my colleague here at Duke University, Steve Churchill, who sort of rattled me and said, yes, I think actually uh, it does. Um, and uh, what, it, what that interaction and interactions with people like Mike Tomasell and Richard Wrangham led me to um, think about in relation to our finding with bonobos being xenophilic, attracted to strangers and, bonobo, and chimps being xenophobic, is that humans have evolved a completely new type of social category, a type of social um, uh, partner that does not exist in any other species. And it is represented by this picture here. Uh, these are in-group strangers, strangers that are in your group. Uh, and only humans recognize in-group strangers. So bonobos are xenophilic. And they recognize strangers based on familiarity or unfamiliarity. They know that group members they interact with frequently are in their group because they're familiar to them. I grew up with them. I know them. I interact with them. Oh, I have never interacted with you, so you're strange to me. Chimpanzees, it's the converse in terms of the emotional response they have. But in terms of the psychological mechanism, it's familiarity. I know that you're familiar. I'm not afraid. We can interact you are unfamiliar, I better be with lots of other males because we're gonna have, we may have a very hostile interaction. So humans do that too. We do obviously respond to familiar and unfamiliar people, but we have another level that we 
recognize people based on and categorize them as in our group or out of our group. And that is based on some marker of group identity. We're the only species that does it. And I think when this evolved, it changes everything for uh, human sociality. And the reason this picture is such a great uh, example of it is these are Duke students. We're at Duke, we're big into basketball. And these are kids that are from, literally from all over the world, like at Oxford. They didn't know each other. Uh, they didn't grow up together. They'd never seen each other, uh, you know, maybe a few months before, maybe today they are meeting and they're all pressed against each other, screaming like crazy, rooting for their team and their group based on some common identity. And this ability to recognize others as uh, our group, even though we've never met before, is a new type of friendliness uh, that I think was selected late in human evolution and explains how we outcompeted the other human species. And the thinking is this, is that uh, before 80, 100, 120,000 years ago, sorry, 120,000 years ago, um, if each of these pictures of this um, uh, young Hads of woman represent a group of people, well, this would be sort of how the standard way that groups of uh, humans would interact across the different species of humans. There would be some exchange of uh, people and information across different groups, but it'd be relatively limited. But as soon as you can recognize in-group strangers, the neighboring group as having some marker of social identity that matches yours, maybe it's your accent, maybe it's how you cook, maybe it's what you wear, Maybe it's uh, some kind of scar that you mark yourself with. It could be anything. It's super plastic what the marker is. But as soon as you could recognize that there's this uh, agreed upon group identity, well, now the social interactions can be like this between groups is that, oh, that's my, uh, even though I don't know you, but we can potentially be friends because you share that marker um, or set of markers um, that I recognize as making you like me and in the same group. This then networks human minds together in a new and more powerful way. Uh, just like the internet exploded innovation because there were now, you know, instead of thousands of people connected over life, it'd be millions of people connected and innovation takes off. It would be a revolution not unlike that where you go from dozens of inter innovators, maybe hundreds, uh, but it would be thousands, tens of thousands of innovators there's now sharing ideas and the cultural ratchet effect can really explode um, and technology takes off and we are the result. Uh, and uh, it, I think it's the key ingredient that was built upon the big brain, the culture and the linguistic abilities. But it was this final ingredient that allowed us to uh, survive and thrive while the other species went extinct. So we have a model not unlike uh, what we came up with with the bonobos. Um, and there's also there's a, a model for how this may have happened that then leads to predictions. Um, again, I can't walk you through all of them. I'm just going to highlight a couple for fun, uh, and then uh, we can uh, um, uh, wrap up. And I'm looking forward to your questions. All right. So um, uh, one of the main predictions is that late in evolution there was selection for friendliness. The friendliness would have been uh, selection for recognizing strangers as group members, but it also would have been selection against within group aggression. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I already tried to um, uh, highlight is that when you select for friendliness in animals, at least, you also have uh, changes in the body that uh, you might be able to use as indicators of selection for friendliness. A way to say that is domestication fossilizes. Uh, and so can we look at uh, signatures in our faces uh, of, and see if we see signs of selection for friendliness? So we did this together with Steve Churchill and uh, we uh, measured together with his student, Bob Sari, uh, humans before and after 80,000 years ago. We looked at um, facial feminization and basically found evidence that uh, more recent humans have more feminized faces. We have much smaller brow ridges, our faces are shorter and a little bit narrower. Um, and this is consistent with what you see in other species when you have selection for friendliness. Uh, one of the predicted things that I'm still really excited about, this remains an uh, untested prediction, but I think it's probably one of the, for me, one of the key predictions is I think that white sclera, the whites of our eyes evolved uh, in our species uniquely. I think that if we could meet a Neanderthal, a Homo erectus, a Denisovan, and look them square in the eye, this is what we'd be looking at. Um, 
humans are the only uh, living primate species that has white sclera. Uh, we uh, don't create the melanin to pigment to pigment our eyes. Uh, and we're really advertising where we look. Um, it's one of the ways that our brain recognizes humans. It, uh, we key in on white sclera very early in development. There's beautiful work by Tobias Grossman looking at uh, uh, the uh, temporal and parietal region as they develop in young children, right as they start using gestures and following gaze, uh, they really start picking up a white sclera. And it's one of the ways that they recognize uh, humans and intentions in others uh, become uh, launch into this cooperative communicative lifestyle and uh, that leads to a cultural uh, being. Um, so I really think that that's an exciting prediction uh, to test. Um, and I think it's not until uh, you have uh, 80,000 years, of, or sorry, in the last 80,000 years, you have uh, self-domestication fully underway that you would uh, see white sclera as we are trying to cooperate and communicate in new ways. Uh, and uh, it ends up that the neural crest cells that are in, have been hypothesized to be involved in uh, dog domestication and um, related to some of the morphological changes in, in terms of the demelanization um, neural crest cells are involved in the development of scleral tissue uh, in humans as well. So I'm really excited about trying to figure out uh, the genetics of uh, white sclera in humans. And I hope somebody uh, leads the way on that. It's a challenge though, because there's zero heritability. You will never meet uh, a human that doesn't have white sclera. So it, and it makes, uh, it, it, unless it's caused by disease, um, but it's not a genetic, there's no gen known genetic orders that I've been able to, to find that uh, lead to melanization uh, in human sclera. Okay. So uh, I want to finish by um, dealing with the reality we're all facing, uh, which is that we live in a world that doesn't feel very friendly often right now. Um, so I've just made the case that really the human, uh, the, the key thing that allowed our, hum our species of human to survive is that we are the friendliest species that ever evolved uh, in our genus. Um, and it, doesn't, it sure doesn't feel like that some days. So how do we deal with that paradox? And so that's actually where Richard's title, The Goodness Paradox, came from. And since I'm his student, uh, you know, I found this challenge irresistible. And here's my take. Uh, I think that the mama bear uh, here is a really helpful metaphor for thinking about human friendliness and our immense uh, capacity for cruelty. So as I've tried to say, uh, we have new types of cooperative communication that really use our theory of mind and allow us to think about the thoughts of others in new and um, more sophisticated ways that allow for compassion and concern for um, in-group strangers, where we care for strangers that are unrelated uh, to us as if they were family members. And as we had stronger concerns, more bonding for those that are non-kin, well, just like a mama bear, the most wonderful nurturing time to see a bear is when it has babies. Um, but this mama bear, when is she most dangerous? When is she potentially most aggressive? When she has babies. And that's what I think is the case with humans. As we became more friendly and more concerned about our in-group strangers, uh, and we have this group identity where I see people as like me, when that identity uh, is um, secure, we're cooperating, we're communicating, we're, we're compassionate to others, especially those that we see as like us. But when that identity becomes threatened, it uh, really reduces our ability to think about the thoughts of others, especially those who are threatening us. Uh, and it sets up this potential for dehumanization. Um, and the dehumanization defined as taking away uh, the full human psychology, especially theory of mind, from other humans. So um, this is a uh, work I want to highlight next by Noor Tiley. We've now replicated with young children uh, the same type of work in our own group. Um, imagine you are asked the following question, which is use the sliders, these little sliders here, these little circles, and slide across and indicate how evolved each group here below might be. Well, you would hope uh, the answer is pretty clear. Uh, they're all fully human. They're all fully evolved. There's no question here. That is not the answer that is returned. Um, this might be the result from a Western group, uh, maybe people from the United Kingdom or the United States. Um, but when this is 
been done cross-culturally. It doesn't matter if you uh, look at different political persuasions, different races, different countries, uh, even young children, five to 12 years of age, we're seeing similar patterns. Um, uh, this, you see dehumanization of other groups. This might be another culture, uh, say a, a culture in the Middle East um, or some other place where uh, you're not attributing full humanity to certain groups of people. And so, the, so it seems that dehumanization, taking away full humanity that then allows you to morally exclude other groups of people is a part or maybe even a product of uh, the increase in friendliness and increased concern for in-group strangers. The reason that dehumanization, I take this work to be so powerful is because when you use standard measures of prejudice, so liking or disliking of a group, it does not predict the worst forms of violence and aggression towards other groups of people. These types of measures of dehumanization do. Uh, they do predict that people who are willing to dehumanize other groups are very accepting of violence towards those other groups. And I think it's because as you have fear or disgust take over uh, your um, attribution of mental states to the group you're uh, threatened by is dampened or reduced. We have evidence of this from uh, neurobiological studies showing that um, precuneus TPJ highly implicated in attribution of theory of mind to others. As you become threatened, it's dampened. And even more frightening is the number one threat. And this is sort of counterintuitive and one of the big surprises of doing the work on the book. One of the biggest threats uh, that allows you to, or sorry, I, causes uh, a group of people to dehumanize another group is if you're told your group is being dehumanized. The threat that is most threatening is you perceive you're being dehumanized, whether it's true or not. So you can imagine if one group is being told by its leaders or by whatever place it's getting its information that you're being dehumanized by this other group. That then is a threat that leads to dehumanization of the other group. One final thing before I leave this is that when, this is the most important thing about dehumanization, is when you are dehumanizing another group and you hear that that dehumanized group is suffering or it may some policy is hurting them, if you're dehumanizing that group and you hear that there's some disproportionate impact of a policy on the group being dehumanized, you become more supportive of the harmful policy. Okay. So to leave on a positive note, as I wrap up here in my last few seconds, uh, I do have a lot of hope for a friendlier future because there is tremendous evidence for how to immunize or counteract dehumanization and have the friendliest parts of our nature express themselves uh, if we can um, uh, set up our institutions and uh, build our cities and schools uh, keeping this in mind, and really contact and integration, cross-group friendships um, between groups that maybe um, uh, have the potential to dehumanize one another. Cross-group friendships have been demonstrated repeatedly through positive intergroup contact uh, to be bridges between groups that then reduce the potential for dehumanization. Um, so I do think that there are um, really interesting implications, and we spend a lot of time in the book talking about uh, how we can guarantee a friendlier future uh, for our species. So let me stop there and say thank you to you, the dogs, the bonobos, and uh, I look forward to entertaining your question, and I have my email and, and Twitter handle down here for those who want to contact me later. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really, really great talk. Um, and so now we've got several questions from the audience. So um, I'll just go ahead and start. So the first one is, do you see the same ability to follow human signals that you saw in experimental foxes and dogs versus the control of foxes and wolves in other domesticated working animals, such as horses that also have to kind of follow human signals? If not, why do you think that might be the case? Thank you for that question. Okay, so the, the key problem, I get asked about cats and horses very frequently. Um, and the problem and the reason I would love to talk about cats and horses, um, but the problem with cats and horses is we do not have uh, access to the progenitor species. We don't have that comparison. We don't have the undomesticated population that's been that has not been selected for friendliness. I would need a captive population of African wildcats 
uh, like we have wolves to compare them to, to see the impact potentially uh, that their life with humans has had on them. Other, other than that, we'd have to do an experiment. Um, so unfortunately, cats and horses haven't contributed to the evolutionary story um, in the same way that dogs can because we have wolves. Thanks. Um, so the next question is, um, when will the book be translated into Portuguese? Because we have a couple of Portuguese followers who are keen on reading it. Well, I would love that. We, we, uh, I hope it happens. Uh, I don't know that we've, oh, actually, you know what? We did have a Portuguese publisher contact us, so it might happen. I know it's going to be in Spanish. Um, I know it's in Japanese. Uh, I think that's as far as we got, um, but I, I hope it comes out in Portuguese too. Um, so the next two questions kind of go together. So I'll just ask them at the same time. So first, did sex of the stranger have any effect on the likelihood of choosing that door versus a group mate or no door? And second, how would you best explain the mate? Oh, sorry. Uh, have you observed sexual differences in bonobos propensity to share food with strangers? Great questions. Um, you know, I, I have the same intuition that you have, the person asking the question that there probably should be some sex differences. And I'm gonna tell you some data that suggests there isn't, but we have sample size issues uh, to really answer your question. Unfortunately, unlike dogs, where I can have samples of thousands or tens of thousands of dogs now in some of our studies, um, I'm, you know, as primatologists, we're, we're really lucky if we can throw together a dozen or two dozen animals. Um, and that really uh, reduces our ability to look at sex differences. But uh, I will say that with the small sample, the relatively small samples we have, we have instances of females um, uh, preferring to share with strange females, uh, males preferring to share with strange females, um, and um, males preferring to share with strange males. The one thing we didn't, we were not able to do is we were not able to do fully adult males. So uh, I don't have nice tests or evidence for adult males sharing with an adult strange male versus a group member male. Um, uh, it was just a sample size issue there. Um, but I would say that uh, the other thing is that it can't be, it's, it's probably not food for reproductive sexual intercourse that is uh, what this is being done for because you have females who are having sexual interactions with each other, but clearly when they let each other in, um, but uh, there, it's clearly not for reproductive purposes. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is we have another series of studies we did where they actually will share with strangers even if they don't let them in to the room they're in. So with, even without a physical interaction, they still will share with them. The next question is, how would you best explain the major differences that we see between chimpanzees and bonobos regarding their friendliness? Well, the argument we've made is that uh, there was a chimpanzee-like common ancestor uh, and that there's been selection for friendliness through sexual selection where females, because they were more gregarious, had more power and they could select males uh, that were friendlier and they could refuse to mate with the most aggressive males. And that then set off this self-domestication process that we see in the foxes. Now, alternatively, uh, it could be that that common ancestor was sort of a mosaic between chimpanzees and bonobos, um, or that common ancestor was more bonobo-like. Um, and depending on what that common ancestor was like, it might alter our model. And it is still, this is an active area of research. And again, I think it's falsifiable. So I think your question is a good one. And, and uh, but right now, if you ask me, I'd say based on the evidence we have, I think bonobos um, are a great example of self-domestication. Thank you. So the next one um, is, do you expect these interactions amongst bonobos to be consistent across various populations? To be consistent. Um, you know, I, I study dogs. Um, and so when you start dealing with thousands or tens of thousands of individuals, um, you know, you start seeing really strong patterns. Um, and so I would expect if we had tens of thousands of bonobos that we could study that, yes, the patterns we're talking about would come screaming out. Um, does that mean that there wouldn't be individual variability and that, you know, across different sites um, uh, that you might not see differences? Of course. But you have to remember that uh, I think a lot of what has built the case is captive work and field work. 
And so you already have bonobos in as extreme different places as you could possibly have them. Um, and as an example of this intra groups, or sorry, uh, of xenophilia in bonobos, um, in the wild, uh, there's no lethal aggression. Uh, while you can have uh, competition between different bonobo neighboring groups and it can be aggressive, uh, there's no raiding or males don't form groups to raid neighboring territories and kill their neighbors, no infanticide. And in captivity, uh, where in a chimpanzee sanctuary or orphanage, you have to keep uh, infant chimpanzees together with their peer age members. You can't take them when they're say five or six and introduce them into a multi-male, multi-female population with adults. Because if you do that, they'll probably be killed. In bonobos, at Loliya Bonobo, once the uh, babies are rehabilitated, you can put them into the multi-male, multi-female group and with adults, and we've never had a problem. Um, so I, I do think that uh, that particular example, I would be surprised if uh, chimpanzees and bonobos don't differ wherever they're found on that one. So you've kind of addressed this next question already in your, the answer you just gave, um, but they asked, have bonobos and humans been compared in terms of reactive and proactive aggression? Ah, uh, okay. So this is where Richard and I, I think, differ a little bit. Um, so Richard has argued, uh, Richard Rangham has argued that um, there are really two types of aggression and that it is, um, uh, you know, really selection on reactive and proactive aggression um, that uh, explains self-domestication. Um, and I don't think he's wrong, um, but I just think there's more than selection against aggression. I actually, I, I don't define self-domestication as selection against aggression. I define it as selection for friendliness. And the reason is because when I was with the foxes in Siberia, the selection pressure was not that they didn't, uh, you know, run away, um, but then you could touch them without them biting you. It was that they, they were selected to like you, to jump in your arms. So it wasn't just selection against aggression, it was selection for friendliness. So next there was a comment um, just saying that they appreciated the in-group stranger approach. Um, and then somebody also asked, can you comment on interbreeding with archaic humans? Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know how to deal, I don't know how to integrate uh, all the exciting findings on uh, you know, interbreeding in humans in the idea of self-domestication. There are probably others who have more sophisticated thinking on this already than I do. Um, I'm sure Richard Rangham would. Um, I would say, uh, you know, one of the predictions would be that, um, you know, if there was direct competition between the different species, that it would be the fact that we could move in larger groups and interact in larger groups that would allow us to, to displace other human um, uh, species. Uh, where that direct competition may have occurred. Um, and how to test that, uh, that's an interesting problem. Um, so the next question is, has the genetic mutation that controls sclera pigmentation been identified? And um, they mentioned the idea of it being homo sapiens exclusive in our lineage could be tested with ancient DNA. Yes, I love that. Yes, uh, no, it has not been identified and I would love for or uh, the use of uh, ancient DNA. Um, so, I mean, I'm, you, want a, you want an instant nature paper, this is it. Um, if you can ID the, when white sclera evolved, it doesn't matter, I mean, maybe I'm probably totally wrong. Um, you know, it's probably millions of years old or whatever. Maybe it's with the evolution of our genus, I don't know. But I really think based on the best evidence that if I was to guess, uh, my prediction based on uh, my version of the self-domestication hypothesis, it should be late in human evolution. So you can falsify me if you can figure it out. And I, I've talked to all sorts of geneticists, everybody from Svante Pabo to Greg Ray here at Duke University. And it's tough. There's, there's not, it, it's because white sclera has no heritability because all humans you will ever meet have white sclera. Isn't it amazing? Um, so uh, it's one of, it is probably the, the, the single trait with the least variance in our species. Um, and so uh, if we could find some way to, figure out when it evolved, I think it would be a really powerful test of self-domestication. So the Takugama chimpanzee sanctuary in Sierra Leone has one young chimp with white sclera. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think there's some really nice papers um, uh, looking at great ape 
individual variability in white sclera. There certainly are great apes that have more white sclera than others. Maybe that's a way in on this problem to identify uh, the, you know, a set of a family of genes involved in this. Um, and I've certainly have seen myself where certain individuals have more white sclera than others. One of the findings I couldn't talk about is that it ends up when you see white sclera and you're making decisions about cooperation, if you see white sclera versus you do not, there's some nice evidence that people are more likely to cooperate. Um, uh, and in fact, human children are much more likely to follow eye gaze than face movement, whereas chimpanzees and bonobos, based on our best uh, studies, um, they prefer and pay attention to your face, changes in your face direction, not your eye movement. So it really seems that eyes have a really special meaning for our social interactions. Thanks. Um, so how stable do you think this model um, in promoting sociality in humans when faced with, uh, is, would this be in promoting sociality in humans when faced with cheating? For example, individuals could receive help from showing group signals without helping other, others and enduring costs. Yeah, you know, I, I, we stay really agnostic in the book um, to those questions. And there are a lot of people who are more sophisticated than I. Um, but I, I just use the foxes as a model and thinking about um, bonobos or cleaner wrasse. Um, I think we're dealing with mutualism potentially. Uh, there may not be uh, a difficult problem to solve in a lot of the non-human cases. The human case is a little bit more complicated because I'm suggesting, and I think Richard's suggesting, there's within group and between group um, interactions. And of course, somebody like David Sloan Wilson um, instantly is going to see potential for using group selection to explain this. Um, and I think this is going to be a really fun thing for people to model. And uh, that's another way to test it. And I, I'm totally agnostic. I, I'm, I just more think uh, I've been more trying to, as much as I can, test and challenge this idea that there's been selection for friendliness that causes through development a change in cooperative communication. Um, and so that's where I feel most comfortable saying I think we've got great evidence exactly what the ecological milieu is that causes that and what the cost benefit and 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 what the selection uh pressure would be that's an exciting but really tough tough problem i hope i hope uh folks work on it um what about tom thomas hobbs contribution to the goodness paradox um specifically so the ability to anticipate and feel potentially threatened as a driver of violence uh so could you read that again yeah, so they asked, what about Thomas Hobbes's contribution to the goodness paradox? Uh, and then they mentioned the ability to anticipate and feel potentially threatened as a driver for violence. Yes, uh, but, but uh, the case I'm making is that, um, so I'm, I'm agreeing with um, uh, that philosophical uh, you know, stand, uh, but I'm adding to it uh, that inextricably linked is friendliness because it is our concern and compassion for those we see as part of our group that leads us to feel threatened and that actually the greatest threat that we can feel is that our identity and those we love including non-kin that are in our group are threatened um, and specifically if they're threatened by dehumanization um, that then that uh, dampens our ability to have compassion for the other group that threatens us, even though they're fully human, we don't see them as fully human, we don't attribute full theory of mind to them. Um, and then that allows us to morally exclude them and to do the most cruel actions. So what I'm trying to say is that our increase in friendliness is inextricably linked to our potential for cruelty. And Richard makes a very um, related argument, but he focuses on slightly different uh, mechanisms. So today, the number of vegan people concerned with animal welfare has increased. Um, in this way, people are able to love and care for others besides our species. How do you think this works? Oh, wow. That is a great question. I'm wondering if I should show a slide for that one. Um, yes, I have it just right here. Good. Um, so I love that question. Um, and the reason I love that question is because I knew about dehumanization going into writing the new book. Um, and I had read enough of the literature I was working on dehumanization, but the, but the two 
concepts that I encountered that I was less familiar with as an evolutionary anthropologist when I went into this was the concept of social dominance orientation and essentialism. Uh, social dominance orientation, uh, there are ways to measure individual variability among humans and how we, have, how we perceive groups uh, along a hierarchy. So basically there's superior groups, inferior groups, and there's a hierarchy. Um, essentialism is that there are stereotypes that we think fit any member of a group and that they're fixed, they're unchangeable, immutable, and different people have uh, stronger feelings about um, essentialism. So one of the remarkable things is that there, there's really nice evidence to suggest, and this is back to the question about uh, veganism and animal welfare and, and um, ethics, how we perceive animals is absolutely crucial to how we perceive different groups of humans and how we uh, perceive the fixity of these stereotypes. So if your worldview is as depicted where there's a hierarchy and a scale of natura and humans are at the top and there's this purposeful movement towards human perfection and animals are um, a group that are inferior, these are people who uh, it's much easier for them to dehumanize because animals are separate. And if a human is like an animal, then it really isn't like a full human. The other version of this is that humans are just another species on the planet. It's a more ecological view of the world and that um, uh, people who have a view of animals as sort of, you know, like humans, uh, each each organism is unique in the world um, and uh, animals are a lot like us in many ways, or maybe they even have abilities we don't have. Those people uh, have lower um, uh, tendency to see group hierarchy uh, and uh, less likely to dehumanize and have essentialist views. So I actually think that how we view animals may be essential uh, to uh, how we view one another and to um, work towards a friendlier future. For those who are animal behavior researchers, um, I do think what we do matters. Thank you. Um, so we're starting to run out of time, so I think we'll just do two more, if that's all right. Um, so the first one is, uh, it seems like there's certain phenotypes associated with the friendliness, e.g. facial features, not bearing physical proximity, et cetera. How are these features perceived across species? And is a species that's friendly to another species due to coevolution, for example, dogs and humans, also friendlier within members of its own species? Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah, that is a, an awesome question. And um, I would say my first caveat is to say, uh, I proposed my version of the self-domestication hypothesis three years ago. Um, uh, Richard uh, proposed uh, his version uh, uh, two, three years ago. Our books have just come out. Um, I think this is the sort of debut of these hypotheses. Um, and so uh, I do think we have some evidence that, um, for instance, I remember Ludmilla Trutt, who, is, who ran the Fox experiment with Dmitry Belayev, telling me, um, and then reading the paper, uh, that the foxes, while they're friendlier to humans, the experimental line, um, and want to be with humans, they're not less aggressive with each other. Um, and in fact, they had done some um, experiments where the experimental foxes were uh, you know, more, more willing and able to dominate than the control line. So I, I think that um, that's gonna be one of the exciting things forward is, um, and even think about the paradox of human friendliness that becoming friendlier led to a new type of aggression. So, um, and I think in the case of dogs, as dogs become friendly, they're attracted to humans. We didn't even tell the whole model of dog evolution here, but the argument is they became friendlier to humans. Um, but they also be, have a new type of aggression, which is if we're threatened, they become aggressive. Um, they try, uh, certain dogs try to protect their human um, group members. Um, and bonobos too, there's new forms of aggression in bonobos where females form alliances against males who threaten their infants. So in some ways, uh, when you have a new type of friendliness, other types of aggression can appear. So I think that's going to be one of the fun things to work out. There's also questions about when you have selection for friendliness and you have these byproducts 
are they uh, are they really stable? Um, and it seems they're not. It seems like there's not a consistent pattern where selection for friendliness, you always have floppy ears or you always have different you know spots or curly tails. It doesn't seem to be consistent. Why is that? Does that disinvalidate the hypothesis or is there an interesting explanation for why that is? <laughs> um, so before we go to our last question, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's been participating on the YouTube channel um, and has been submitting great questions. Um, so our final question is, um, it's about scleral pigmentation. Are there differences in scleral contrast uh, with iris between dogs and wolves and between the two types of foxes? Uh, there is, so that's why the sclera story with dogs is interesting. Uh, they have this muscle where they can actually flash their sclera uh, at humans in a way uh, that wolves cannot. So literally there are morphological studies that have been conducted by Julian Kaminsky and her colleagues um, where they were able to show, um, this is at Portsmouth, so in the United Kingdom, uh, they've been able to show that um, wolves do not have the musculature to flash white sclera, whereas dogs, dogs ha may or may not have more white sclera, but they show more white sclera as a result. Um, uh, and and uh, it is the case that there's depigmentation of pupils in dogs and humans, um, and that may be further uh, demelanization as a result of domestication. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. So I just want to give um, a big thank you. I think we've, we've had a lot of comments saying thank you on the YouTube channel and just saying what a great talk this has been. So I just wanted to pass that on to you. Um, thank you. And with that, we will end our live stream for today. Great fun. Thank you, everybody.